Welcome to lesson number four, basic statistics in our Green Belt Six Sigma program series. My name is Ajay Sharma from Bob Cash University. So please uh, subscribe to this channel and uh, boost your career by a crystal clear knowledge of the concepts in Six Sigma. Okay, so we proceed to our lesson number four. So in this lesson, we are going to study the types of data that we have in Six Sigma. You have to have a very clear understanding of the data types in our journey in Six Sigma. Because Six Sigma relies very heavily on data, it's important to understand what are the data types because if the data type change in the Six Sigma project, the tools that apply to it also change. So you should know which data I am having in my projects. Accordingly, you will apply the tools. So that's why it's important to know what are the data types. Though there are basically two types of data that we will encounter in the Six Sigma journey. One is the continuous data and another is called discrete data. So primarily these are the two categories that we will always face in our Six Sigma projects. Now we will see in a, a very clarity what is the actual meaning of continuous data and how really it differs from the discrete data. Let's see this example. So on the left hand side, you see a man climbing a bar, right? Now, and on the, on, on, this is called a continuous data. We'll just explain how it is. In the discrete section, you see a man climbing the same distance using the stairs, right? Now, this man, while climbing up the bar or the rope can take any value of the distance from the ground that he wants so the data can take any value what does what does it really mean let us see by this further explanation let's focus on the feet of the person who is climbing the rope now at this position his feet is 25 let's say 25 centimeter from the ground next he can climb up and maybe go to 30.33 centimeter from the ground he goes up again and reaches maybe 44.93 centimeters from the ground the point is he this feet can take any value from the point number one to point number two so his feet can take any value from this distance to this distance see it can it is 25 it can go in decimals it can go in the three decimal places it can go four decimal places it can take any value you tell me the distance from the ground and i will tell that where his feet lower feet should be on the bar but in the other case come to this gentleman in his case the data comes in packets and cannot take any value so for example his lower feet now is 25 centimeter from the ground the next stage will be definitely 50 centimeter from the ground it cannot be 25 point something it cannot be 30 it cannot be 45 because there is no space he will fall down there is no bar where he can put his feet. In the same fashion, the data also behaves in two modes. Either it has the ability to take the any form like this, or it does not have the ability to take any form like this. So either it takes the continuous form, that means I can take any value like this, my feet can take any value on this bar or rope or 
I, I can have discrete data, which means the data comes to me only in packets. It's not continuous. Packet number one, 25. Packet number two, 50. Next stage is 75. There is nothing in between. There is no freedom to take any value in this case. 25, 50, 75, like that. So here there is freedom of the data to take any value. Here there is no freedom of the data to take any value. This is the difference between continuous data and discrete data. So, continuous data is free to take any value by its nature. We'll see examples of continuous data and discrete data which will clarify further. So before we go to examples, a quick uh, recapitulation. Continuous data, it's also called variable because it can vary to any value. So this, is this can be measured on a continuous scale. What's a continuous scale? A scale wherein all values between the lowest and the highest reading are possible to the least count of the scale so whatever is the least count of the scale you can have any values between that so what whatever is the least count till that value from the minimum value of the scale to the maximum value of the scale the measurement can take any value so that's why it can be measured on a continuous scale this continuous data can always be expressed in a smaller unit of measure you can reduce the least count of the measurement scale and you can go to decimal places so the more you reduce the least count of the measuring scale the lower you can take the reading of that continuous data so this is what it means it can go to smaller and smaller variables continuous data is often obtained with a measurement system so you need a measurement system that means you need a measuring scale you need a person who is measuring you need an environment to measure and so on but in a discrete data it cannot be meaningfully divided into smaller increments like in this case, continuous case, if you decrease the least count of the measuring scale, you can measure smaller and smaller and smaller units of that variable. But in this case, you cannot divide it, in, divide it into uh, smaller increments beyond a certain level. So this is, uh, Im imagine the man climbing the stairs in the previous slide. He cannot go between 25 centimeters from ground and 50 centimeters from ground you can't take a reading of 30 or 40 or 45 this is what it means it cannot be meaningfully divided into smaller increments it has to be 25 then 50 then 75 and so on and as we have seen discrete data can only take a finite number of values it cannot take infinite values for example it's the same like 25, 50, 75, 100. It cannot take 25.1, 25.2, 25.3. So it has a limited, finite means a limited number of values. Whereas this can take any value. Let us look at the examples of each type of variable. Come to con continuous variable. Examples are time. You can have time in hours in minutes in seconds you can even break the seconds to hundredth uh, part to thousand part so depending upon the uh, least count of the measurement you can have any time uh, recorded so it has the freedom to take any value come to weight your weight can be 50 kg 51, 51.2, 51.128, and so on. The distance traveled by a taxi. 
So if a taxi travels from point A to point B, uh, at any given point of time, it will show the distance traveled in uh, decimal places. So if you if you give the distance in one decimal place or two decimal place or whatever distance you give, there will be a time available at which the taxi would have achieved that distance, right? But in this case, come to the same taxi example, the bill amount shown in the taxi meter, the bill amount shown in the taxi meter jumps by packets. It does not have the freedom to take any value. So from one unit, it will go to two unit, depending upon whatever the uh, logistics owner has decided. So it, it will jump in that fashion. So unit one, unit two, unit three, it will not be uh, unit one, 1.1, 1.2 like this. It cannot have any value. It will jump as per a sequence and in packets. Another example, if we are counting, for example, the gender, male and female, uh, you can have only limited categories in this. You cannot have infinite categories in gender. So the data, uh, is limited in terms of the variability. So that's discrete. Another example, if I am selecting, I am the inspector of a product and I am rejecting and accepting a product on a production line, I can say only good and bad. I don't have infinite options of my declaration. So this is a discrete data. Another yes, no type of results is also discrete data because again, it has not unlimited variability it can show its presence only in limited packets or only in limited number of values so these are some of the examples uh, number of errors one more example number of errors in an invoice so number of errors in an invoice can be only one two three you cannot have 1.5 errors in an invoice the uh, mistakes or the errors are limited. They cannot have an infinite value. You cannot have 3.8 errors in an invoice, right? So that's a continuous data and that's a discrete data. The, please remember, you have to categorize these data types before proceeding because the tools that apply to continuous are different and the tools that apply to discrete are different. We come to the next topic in the basic statistics, population and sample. This is very important for you to understand because uh, the fashion in which statistics uh, studies the environment uh, is, is uh, linked to the understanding of the difference between population and sample. What is a population? Population is the unique and the complete set of data complete set of data whose parameters are unknown you cannot completely know the parameters of the full population not only that even if you attempt to know the parameter of a complete population because the data is complete it's a full data you cannot know the parameters of the full data even if you attempt it is impractical it is impractical to calculate the population parameter directly from the data. I'll just give an example and show some pictures and this concept will become more and more clear. But at the time you have to remember these three bullets. The population is a complete set of any data that you are measuring. Uh, but whose parameters are unknown to you? They will never be known. And also never been known means never been known directly so it's impractical to calculate the population parameter directly from the population data and many times in fact it's not only impractical but impossible it's not feasible and also illogical the results will be wrong it is illogical to calculate the population parameter directly what does that mean let us see by this example. Let's see, this is the population of a province or a state or a small country. And you have been given the task to find the average weight of youth 
from 18 years and 35 years, both years inclusive, in a state or in a country. Now, it is impractical to calculate the population uh, average weight between 18 years to 35 years of this whole province or the whole state or the country. And it is illogical because the time that you will take, the time that you will take to take the weight of all the people or the data in this population, that, that time, uh, between that time, the weight of the people itself will change. For example, you take about two years to take the average, uh, to, to, to measure everybody's weight from 18 years to 35 years. You take two years to do this. Now, within that two years, by the time you reach the last man or the last woman, the actual weight of the people will change. So you will come out with an average that is wrong. So that's why we said directly, if you want to know the population parameter, it will always be unknown and it will is, it's illogical and a stupid idea. It's wrong. Okay, it's not only unknown, it's illogical and it's impossible. Right? So you, 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 it's a foolish attempt to calculate uh, or, to, or to measure the weight of everybody in this country or the state or the province ranging from 18 years to 35 years. Right? But then what do we do? I am studying statistics. I am, I, I, my job is to measure parameters. But you are saying that uh, population parameters cannot be known. So what do we do? We go to the sample. How? So, using a sample of data, you draw conclusions about the entire population of the data. This is not only accurate, then one by one counting everybody and by the time you count the last one, the average itself changes or whatever parameter you are counting itself changes. So, rather than doing that, you use a sample of data and draw conclusions about the entire population. This is nothing but the whole crux of statistics. This is the whole philosophy of statistics. You are studying the sample to make a prediction on the population, right? You make a study on the sample to make a prediction or a conclusion on the population parameter that you care for. So, Using a sample of data, you draw conclusions about the entire population of data. This is known as statistical in, uh, inference. This is known as statistical inference. And this is the whole philosophy be behind the science called statistics. So, let's see this nice example. This is the entire population of data. Let's say we, this is the same... Uh, uh, population data that we saw in the previous slide where we need to measure the weight of the people from 18 years to 35 years in a country or a province or a state. So I, I don't know what is the average weight of people from 18 to 35 years. The population parameters are unknown and I'm not stupid to count everybody's weight to know the average weight from 18 to 35, 35 years. What do I do? I take samples from a population. I take a few samples from here, a few samples from here, I take few samples from here and few samples from here. So, uh, in my further videos, I will also educate you on how to take sampling, what is this sample size and what really should be the practice for doing the sampling. But at this moment, we are studying the relationship between population and sample and how they help each other. So, we take samples that are representative of the entire population, right? You should take samples which represent adequately the population. For example, if you are taking uh, the weight of people, you should not take only the weight of men from 18 to 35. You should also take the weight of 
women from 18 to 35 you should not only take the weight of men from a particular region you should take the weight of the men from here from here from here and similarly for women you should take the weight of the women from 18 to 35 from here from here from here the idea is the popul the sample should be adequately representing the population right so so in my in my further videos you can uh, see how to take the sample and what exactly is the sample size how much is 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 enough but at this moment we are studying population and sample so take a sample from here analyze the average weight for example if you if you want to take that example uh, take the average uh, of this sample and we analyze uh, sorry we, we analyze the sample and come out with a parameter which is called sample parameter in our example it is the average weight of this sample hmm? this is not the population this is the average weight of the sample of people from 18 years to 35 years then based on this average we make a statistical inference we make a statistical inference using uh, tools of statistics which predict the same parameter of the population so from our sample parameter let's say the weight is x kg the average weight of the people from 18 years to 35 years of this sample is x kg using statistical infer uh, statistical inference and statistical tools we predict we predict that the entire country or the entire state or the entire province would be having an average weight of y kg right so we have average weight of x kg here of the sample using statistical inference and tools we will predict that the entire country or the province would be having an average weight of y from x maybe little bit different or y right y kg per uh, y kg is the average weight of people of the entire country ranging from 18 years to 35 years so this is how the statistics or the statistical inference works coming to the next uh, topic central tendency and spread of the data this topic also you will come across many many times in your six sigma project journey so there are two important aspects of data one is the central tendency what is this this tells us what does where sorry where does the average where does the average of my data lie in whatever range of data i have where is the average where is most of the data uh, lying or if i count the next if i count the next reading what what most likely it is going to fall in so most most likely it is going to fall in average you know in in a crude form you can understand like this where does the average of my data lie what is spread spread tells us how much is the variation in the data how much it is going on the right side how much it is going on the left side what is the range or the variability of my data what is the variability of my data now let's see how to calculate central tendency and spread these two things are very important and you will see them time and again during your projects of six sigma so come to central tendency let's say this is the weight of children in kilograms in all the high schools of a province in canada so we 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 select a province in canada and uh, we take the uh, weight of children studying in high school and group them 
in this data so people there would be some uh, children from 35 kg to 37 kg there would be i'm not showing you how many children so but there would be some children from 37 to 39 kg there would be some children from 39 to 41 kg and so on i want to know what is the average is the average of the data 30, uh, between 37 and 39 kg is the average weight of children in these schools lying between 37 and 39 kg or is it lying between 39 and 41 kg or is is it lying between another uh, data between 47 kg and 49 kg that means uh, is most of the data lying around 47 and 49 where is the average if i take the weight of the next child where i should expect his weight to be the most likely hmm? or is it lying between 43 and 45 kg right so if i take the weight of the next child in this uh, category of uh, the high school does it lie right this is called central tendency or average now how do you calculate the central tendency how do you calculate the central tendency so as i said a central tendency is nothing but the average there are three ways <clears throat> there are three ways to calculate the central tendency mean median and mode right so we'll go one by one and really study each one and find out how each one is calculated and what is the significance of each way of calculating the standard uh, sorry central tendency over the other so we go to the first one mean mean or the arithmetic mean sometimes it is called is the sum of all the data that you have divided by total number of data so let's say if we have these numbers with us 15 4.2 10 and so on i want to calculate the central tendency by mean i want to calculate the central tendency by calculating the mean so as the formula says mean is the addition of all these values 15 plus 4.2 plus 10 plus 8.9 divided by the total number of data so this is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so i divide by 10 so addition of this comes out to be 107.1 divided by 10 is 10.71 what is this so this is the mean what is the disadvantage of the mean what is something that lacks in the mean mean is very sensitive to extreme values so if suddenly one value is very high this figure is going to change drastically so this is the disadvantage of the mean that it is very sensitive to outliers or extreme values or values that are suddenly become big we will see that by an example but this is how you calculate the mean sum of all data divided by the total number of data so this is what i meant suddenly i increase i put another factor you see this was only 15, till 15 i put another value of 200 here now 200 suddenly becomes quite different from the other values so is so this is called an extreme value right extremely high value so as the formula says i will add everything so add i add 15 plus 4.2 plus 10 plus 8.9 till 100 
and divide it by 11. Now they will become 11 because I put another value 200. I take the sum total of everything. It is 307.1 divided by 11. And my goodness, now the average comes to 27.91. What was the what was the earlier one? 10.71. 10.71. By just adding one extreme value, it has shot up to 27.91. And now your mean is saying that average is 27.91. This is nowhere near to the data. This is nowhere, in fact, this is nowhere near to any of the data. This is too big for them and this is too small for this. So this is the problem in the mean. It gets too much uh, affected by extreme values or the outliers or the values that are very different from rest of the data. <clears throat> Come to the next uh, way to calculate the central tendency and that is the median. What is a median? So in the median you have to arrange the numbers in a rising or falling order. In an ascending or rising or descending or falling order. After you do this the middle number is the median. Simple. So these are the numbers I have. <clears throat> so I will first arrange them in ascending or descending order. I have chosen them to set them in a descending order. But if you set them in an ascending order, doesn't make any difference. I set them in a descending order and I found I, I sorry, I find out the middle number. What is the middle number? So you, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. These are 11. So there should be uh, 3, 4, 5 here and 5 here. So I leave 5 here and 5 here. So this is this central number or the middle number. This is called the median. So I arrange in ascending or descending order and whatever is the middle value, I declare it as the median but what happens now here we had 11 numbers right 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 so in an odd number it is very easy to find the middle number so 5 on the right side 5 on the left side right and the middle number is the median but what if you have an even number now you have how many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now you have only 10. You cannot have equal numbers on the left hand side and equal number of data on the right hand side. What will you do and how will you calculate the median in this case? Again, set them in the ascending or descending order and the middle numbers is the mean now. So what are the middle numbers? You have to take two numbers now, 11 and 10. So 4 on the left side. Four, digit, uh, 4 numbers on the left side, 4 numbers on the right side and this time the middle numbers become 2 numbers instead of 1. What are they? 11 and 10 because you cannot have a single uh, number as the middle. You will have 2 numbers as the middle and you cannot have 2 medians. So how will you select the median in this? In this case, you will find the mean. We found out, uh, you know, the mean in the previous slide. You will find the mean of these two numbers, which is 11 plus 10 divided by the numbers, which is 1 and 2. So you divide it by 2. This is 21 by 2, which is 10.5. So this 10.5 becomes the median of these set of numbers. What is the advantage of mean? Advantage of mean is unlike mean which we have seen before, median is not sensitive to extreme values. See, we put an extreme value 200 for the mean and its value shot up drastically. We are doing the same treatment here. We'll put one more number here, 200, which is much higher than this. It's an extreme value. It's, it's much higher compared to the rest of the people, right? So what do we do? We follow the again 
same steps arrange the numbers in ascending or descending order i put this numbers in a descending order and this time i have put a outlier an extreme value as in the case of mean let us see what happens median changes or not and if it changes by how much what is the middle number now in this one so this is how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 numbers so uh, 5 on the left hand side and 5 on the right hand side again this is your middle number right five numbers on the left hand side and five numbers on the left hand side so this is the middle number so what's your median the middle number this is the middle number this is your median so the median is much less sensitive to extreme values compared to mean when you did not have the 200 extreme value what was your median 10.5 and when i added an extreme value of 200 it shot up only from 10.5 to 11 right it's just a small increase whereas in mean it shot up drastically to 27 something from 10 so mean uh, median is much much less sensitive to extreme values is not affected by the addition or subtraction of an outlier or an extreme value or a value which is different from rest of the group right come to the next method of calculating the central tendency which is the mode what is the mode mode is very simple it is the most occurring data in the group of data the most occurring data so for example i have this data with me what is occurring the most 15 occurs two times 4.2 occurs one time 10 occurs one time 9 occurs one time but i see 13 occurring three times so 3 is the highest there is no other number that is occurring four times so the highest occurring data is 13 because it occurs three times the maximum one so the mode is 13 the most occurring data is the mode most occurring data here is 13 so mode is 13 and like median mode also is less sensitive to mean mode also is less uh there is a th th this is wrong it should be less sensitive to extreme value so like median mode also is less sensitive to extreme value not mean extreme value this is wrong huh? i'm uh, sorry for that this is extreme value so it is less sensitive to extreme value for example i replace this 15 by 1000 i remove this 15 and put 1000 here even then the highest occurring data remains the same 13 3 three times again your mode will be 13 so it is very less sensitive to extreme values so what's the advantage of mode <coughs> oh sorry this is another advantage so mean and mode mean and mode are both less sensitive to extreme values but there is another advantage of mode which is both over mean and median there is an advantage of mode which is not there in mean which is not there in median what is that advantage of mode it can be applied to a discrete data a full discrete data remember we have learned discrete data which has limited uh, freedom of values which has limited freedom of values or limited variability for example if you have a pass fail data you have a scores of children who which is mentioned only in the format of pass fail pass fail now if you have 1000 pass fail i want to know the mode uh, pass is occurring the most or fail is occurring the most by that i can find out the mean uh, i mean the central tendency so uh, i have a uh, 100 children results expressed in pass fail somebody tells me to find out the central tendency 
Now using this mean I cannot uh, calculate because I cannot add pass plus fail, pass plus fail. It is meaningless. It's, it's a non-numerical data. So I cannot calculate median because I cannot arrange this in ascending or descending order. But I can know which is the most occurring. Pass is occurring the most or fail is occurring the most. Let's say pass is occurring the most. Then according to definition, the most occurring data is the mode. So I will declare that pass is the central tendency of the data because mode is one of the ways to find out the central tendency of the data. Right? This is a striking advantage of mode which is not there in mean, which is not there in median. And what's that? That it can be applied to non-numerical data or full discrete data which does not have the freedom to take any value just any value so similarly days of the week i want to know <clears throat> i think let's let's take this example for better understanding <clears throat> yes this is a 15 day data on the sales crossing the target in a mall so i took uh, Fifteen days of data uh, continuously, and I found out that on uh, on the day on the on the day it crossed the target on the day the sales crossed the target that was a Sunday. The next time the sales crossed the target was a Wednesday, right? I'm continuously counting. The next day. I uh, the next day on which the sales crossed the target was again a Sunday. Similarly, the next day and next day and next day like this and the last day uh, on which the sales crossed the target was a Wednesday. And after that I stopped my readings. I gave this data to my manager and he told me i want to give an offer to the clients who have a, a, a offer to the clients on the day <clears throat> the sales is more so please tell me the central tendency of the data please tell me the central tendency of the data now i cannot use mean here i cannot use median here so what i will do i will calculate the most occurring data what is the most occurring data what can you see from the data? It's Wednesday. So Wednesday is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There is no other day more than Wednesday on which the sales have crossed the target set by the mall. So the most occurring data is Wednesday. Hence, mode is Wednesday. Hence, the central tendency is Wednesday. So I will tell to my manager, dear manager, the central tendency of the sales crossing the target is Wednesday. So he will give an offer to the clients on Wednesday. So this is how you calculate central tendency using mode for a data which is non-numerical, cannot be counted and obviously which is uh, discrete doesn't have the freedom to take any value you can't have anything between sunday and monday for example okay so these are the three ways you find out the central tendency so very quickly the summary of uh, central tendency unique advantage of mean is all the data is taken into account for calculating the mean because you are adding everything and dividing dividing it by the number of uh, the data so all the data taken into account for calculating the mean of data so what is the use the use is no data is left out so what so it is representing a, that is a representative of all the data the mean is taking into account all the data it's a very good representation of all the data nobody is left out so what so the results are accurate. This is the unique advantage of mean over median. 
and over mode that's why even if the mean is more sensitive to extreme values it is mostly used because of accuracy of results right what is the unique advantage of median we have seen it is very less sensitive to extreme values come 200 or for example this is a bigger value still your mean would not median would not be much different we have seen in the previous examples what is the advantage a unique advantage of mode apart from being less sensitive to extreme values the unique advantage of mode mode is <clears throat> you can find out the central tendency of a non numerical data right this is the data of uh, good bad what is the central tendency of the data good because good is three times the maximum occurring data that's the uniqueness of unique advantage of mode right what is spread now remember we have the two important uh, parameters uh, central tendency and the spread now we come to the spread what is spread spread tells us how much is the variation is the, in the data and what is the variability in the data we have two uh, methods by which we found we sorry we find out the spread the range and the standard deviation what's the range range is the highest value minus the lowest value right for example we have this set of data i want to know the spread of this data by using range so what i will do range is equal to the highest value you can see is 400 here the lowest value is 1 so range becomes 399 this is giving me an indicator of spread of the data how much the data is varying is varying by 399 so what do i do highest value minus lowest value now the problem in range is it does not take into account all the data it it doesn't care about 12 doesn't care about 23 doesn't care about 6 it takes only two values highest and the lowest number this is a big problem it's it's not going to be realistic it's not going to be reliable why because it just doesn't care about anybody else except the highest and the lowest number it takes into account only two values so what happens now this is your uh, this is this data i have plotted this on a number line right so this is this number line is nothing but representing this data in the box 1 2 6 8 what what do you see this bracket is basically the data variation this is a more realistic data variation because most of the data is lying here you can see the most most of the data is lying here there is only one data which is 400 it is called an outlier which is quite different from the population if if you if you don't see this all the data is here so most realistic data variation is this but what does the range tell you range tells you that your data is here from this to this so more realistic data variation is the upper bracket and the range or the data variation or the spread told to you by the range is the lower parenthesis or the lower bracket which is not realistic so range is not a very reliable measure or a of spread as it is highly sensitive to extreme values it is just a crude method of uh, to know the idea of the spread so then what do we do we use mostly the other type of the parameter of spread which is the standard deviation standard deviation is highly used as indicator of spread in most of the studies that you will do in your six sigma journey <clears throat> while execution of your project it takes into account all type of data and not just extreme values like range it is almost not affected by extreme values and this is highly practical and accurate but how do we calculate the standard deviation standard deviation is denoted by the small greek letter called sigma the definition is 
this one don't get baffled by the uh, tough english or don't get baffled by the formula it's very easy to calculate the only thing is the definition goes from left to right but you have to calculate from right to left we'll just see that in a very very easy example but what's what's the standard deviation uh, definition it's the square root of what square root of average average of what average of sum of squares sum of squares of what the difference from the mean it may sound little bit crazy but when you do it it's very easy S root square of average of sum of squares of difference from the mean so all i means individual all individual readings when they are differentiated from the mean when you take the difference this x bar is the mean this x bar is the mean when you take the difference of all the individual values from the mean add the uh, so, sorry square each value add all the square average it by the number of readings and square root it it is a standard deviation it looks very difficult on this slide i know because of the english and the formula but just see how simple it is in the coming slides these are the individual readings i have of some parameter and i want to know the standard deviation of this data so what was standard deviation rule square root of average of sum of squares of difference from the mean as i told you you read it from left to right but you calculate it from right to left i will calculate from reverse from right to left how so what it is asking to calculate the mean huh? i'm going from right to left i'm going from right to left so what is first coming to me calculate the mean okay i calculate the mean of this is 5.1 how do i calculate the mean i add everything and divide it by the number of readings i add we have seen that in the previous slide how to calculate mean i add all the numbers and divide by the number of data so i get mean 5.1 what is the formula asking next i am going reverse the difference from the mean right it is asking difference from the mean that means xi minus x bar i have already calculated x bar x bar is the mean right <clears throat> my mean was 5.1 right we calculated the mean it was 5.51 5.1 sorry so 4 minus 5.1 is minus 1.1 4 minus 5.1 is minus 0.6 4.2 minus 5.1 is minus 0.6 what am i doing i am taking the difference of each reading from the mean each reading from the mean 6 minus 5.1 0.9 so i am taking the difference of each reading from this mean of 5.1 because the formula is telling me to take the difference from the mean so i take the difference what is the formula telling me to square them remember i am going reverse to square this difference so all these columns i will square it and i get this minus 1.1 whole square is 1.1 Minus 0.6 whole square is 0.36, and so on. What is the formula telling me next? To sum all these squares, so I will add all this, and I will get the sum as 11.71. What is this? This is the sum of squares. I'm going still reverse now. It is take, telling me to take the average of this. It's telling me to averageize this. number 11.71 take the average of sum of squares what is that so this is the total square difference from the mean 11.71 i want to take the average i want to take the average average is you have to just divide by the number of readings there are number of readings is 20 so 1 2 3 4 5 likewise you you count everything these are 20 readings these are 20 readings so i 
whenever you to want to take an average you have to di divide it by the number of data the number of data here is 20 so i am dividing by 20 minus 1 now what is this minus 1 don't be worried about it this is nothing but degrees of freedom i will explain it. it's a very very simple thing degrees of freedom in the coming videos so at the moment you just for you consider this 19 and 20 as the same because you are yet to study what is degrees of freedom so for uh, at this stage you are just seeing that i am averaging this 11.71 figure by dividing it by the number of data anyway if this data is very high minus 1 and will not make it any difference for example if it is 1000 1999 is not much difference that way so don't don't look at this so just remember that we are dividing it by the number of data what do we get we get average of sum of squares 0.6163 and in the end what is the formula asking me to take the square root because i am going opposite from right to left last is the square root i take the square root of this 0.6161 and i get 0.785 this is nothing but the standard deviation of <clears throat> this readings right so it was very easy the trick is to go reverse from right hand side towards left hand side and you will get the standard deviation of the data right we are coming to the end of the video now very quickly i will tell you what is the physical meaning of this standard deviation standard deviation means so uh, although i have explained the physical uh, meaning of standard deviation in my previous videos but just for the recap uh, in this video i am not going to explain this blue color curve because it is explained in the previous videos so let's say this blue color curve is your distribution of data of all the readings uh, standard deviation physically meaning uh, means for example, you had standard deviation 0.785. It means plus one sigma above the mean and plus one sigma below the mean. Whatever area comes in between, whatever this shaded area comes in between this, it contains 68.26 percentage of the whole data population. This is the, just the physical meaning of the standard deviation apply to the practical uh, population right so our uh, standard deviation for 0.785 so it means 0 0.785 this side of the mean and 0 0.785 this side of the mean whatever is the mean you add 0 0.75 and you subtract 0 0.785 uh, <coughs> from the mean whatever the area coming in this contains 68.26 percentage of the population similarly if you go plus minus 2 sigma plus 2 times 0 0.785 and mean minus 2 times 0.785 whatever the area shaded area comes in between or below the curve contains 95.44 percent of the data population and if you go plus 3 sigma and minus three times standard deviation so this is uh, three times uh, 0.785 this is three times 0.785 that means whatever is the mean value add 0.785 to it and whatever is the mean value minus three times 0.785 whatever the distance is coming and whatever the area is coming under this curve contains almost 99% or to be precise 99.73% of data population this is the physical interpretation of standard deviation you can see my other videos where i have a very detailed uh, explanation on the physical meaning of standard deviation <clears throat> there is one another parameter to calculate uh, spread it is called variance it is nothing but standard deviation which you have just learned the square of that so the square of standard deviation which you have just learned is the variance right so 
summarizing there are three types to calculate the central tendency mean median mode three ways to calculate the spread range standard deviation and variance most commonly that you are going to use most of the time uh, in your projects will be mean as part of central tendency and standard deviation as part of the spread but there will be times when you will be using other parameters as well <clears throat> this is the end of the video please subscribe to this channel we are coming with uh, fascinating videos more on uh, statistics our aim is to make you finally a six sigma master black belt we are starting from uh, green now we'll go to the black we'll go to the mbb tools please like comment and share this video and uh, visit this video on bob cash university thank you very much this is ajit sharma signing off bye bye and take care